Hey, good morning, everybody. We hope that you're doing well and uh, welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live today. I'm Jeff Edwards for the University of Wyoming Extension, located in the uh, oh, eastern side of the state near Torrington. And my co host today is Abby Perry. Good morning, Abby. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, and you? Very good. Abby is an uh, extension educator located in Carbon County, the lovely Rollins area. And um, uh, our third person uh, that is hosting is Jenny Thompson. You probably won't be able to see her today, but you might be able to hear her at some point. She's the individual that keeps everything running for us and, uh, uh, well, running smoothly. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. We're glad you're here. Our guest today is Caitlin Youngquist. Good morning, Caitlin. Good morning. Thanks for the invitation today. We are really happy to have you here, and uh, we are going to be talking about composting and uh, maybe some soil things too. Is that correct, or just strictly composting? We can talk about anything you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. So it's uh, it's up to you as our as our guests, our wa people people watching, to uh, direct the conversation. How's that sound? Ask lots of questions. I guess is what we're saying. Um, and in order to do that, uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you take your mouse and uh, or your yeah your mouse and roll over the top of your screen, you can click on the chat button, ask a question there, or you can use the Q and A button and ask your question there. We'll be monitoring those things. And if you're watching live on Facebook, if you use the comments area. Jenny will be pulling those questions forward and bringing them to us in Zoom so we can get Caitlin asked. And uh, I think that's all I needed to cover. So Caitlin, I am going to turn the floor over to you. And if, you, if there's more that you would like to say about yourself before we get started, fantastic. If not, let's dive right in. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm the Extension Educator in Washakie County, and I do love sharing information about compost, and I really hope folks will chime in with questions or their own experiences or things they can share. And if we have time, I'm also happy to talk about soil and using compost and why um, it might be a benefit. So I'm going to start with just a few little, uh, just a few, an introduction, I suppose, and a few of the high points that I want to share, and then hopefully we'll make lots of time for, um, for questions and, and other things here. It may, let's make it an interactive event. Very interactive, yes. <laughs> I'm going to do that really obnoxious thing, Jeff. Can you see my screen? I can. Uh, oh, you're not my seeing view, my presentation, are you? Uh, my view is a little bit different today, and I'm trying to figure out why. We can see your presentation. It just wasn't on uh, speaker Excellent. mode. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that we always have to say. Can you see my screen? You're on mute. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, is that what we want? That is yeah. what we want. Thank That's you. Fun. Okay, so here we go. So um, a lot of what we really, to talk about compost and soil and plants, we have to talk about the microbes. And so uh, we have a lot of hardworking microbes, primarily bacteria, fungus, actinomycetes, various things like that, nematodes that are um, making the plant nutrients available to the plants. And so the things that we think of as organic waste materials, leaves, grass, manure, food waste, um, anything that was alive at one point and is decomposing, the nutrients that are in those materials become available to the plants we are trying to grow through the microbes in the compost and in the soil. And it's a natural process that's happening um, already in nature. And when we, when we um, talk about composting, we're really basically talking about trying to speed that process up and make it more uniform and serve our needs a, a little better. But this is a natural process, this decomposition that's happening all the time around us. So really uh, another way to think about it is microbe farming. We're trying to set this environment up to have the most productive, the most efficient microbes to create um, an organic amendment for our soil. And we can do it a variety of ways. It can be done with, um, it can be done with a fast or hot composting method where we get um, the temperature up to a, to a level over 130 degrees to kill pathogens or weed seeds and to make it happen a lot faster. It can be done much slower where we don't get the, the height, the temperature that we would get with our hot composting. It can be done with worms. It can be done 
um, in a raised bed. It can be done in a lot of different ways. So there are many ways. It's a very forgiving process, actually. And really, we're just trying to get nature to do the work for us and the microbes to do the work for us. And we're making, we're, we're transforming what, would, what we would call a waste product, an organic waste product of some sort, into plant food or into nutrients or breaking it down into the nutrient small pieces that the plants can use. And we're also putting a lot of that carbon back into the soil to feed the soil microbes. And so it can be used is, for, oh, go I'm ahead. sorry to interrupt, is a uh, component of composting uh, patients? Somewhat, yes, patients, it is. <laughs> Yes, okay, especially good. here where it's cold and dry. Yes, okay. <laughs> so that's, I should put that on my next ingredient slide, compost ingredients, food, water, air, and patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and we can use our compost for various things. Mulch is a great use, um, starting seeds, amending our soil, adding it to potting soil. And it, a lot of that depends on our, on our final quality of product and what we want for it. I think what I'd like you to remember is not only to take some patience, but also it can be a very forgiving process and if you understand the basic biology, food, water, and air, and microbes, um, it's scalable and it can be very accommodating in a variety of materials. Uh, it doesn't have to be very complicated. So Caitlin, with here on your seed starting, I know oftentimes your seed starting mixes are like sterilized. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's why they're good for starting seeds is that you don't have to worry about, you know, the, the disease type things affecting right. seedlings. So can you touch on that of how compost can maybe still work as seed starter? So if you're making your own, uh, and you may know more about this, Abby, but if you're making your own seed starting mix, often it's sterilized in the oven, you can do that at home. And so if you're making your own seed starting mix with some compost, you can, you can sterilize it at home. Also worm castings or worm compost um, is very, very good for seed starting in terms of um, whatever is in there um, has, a, has a benefit for seed germination and, the, and those initial seedlings. And so those are two things that you might consider with the seed starting. Okay. So our basic compost biology, I mentioned that it's, it's um, scalable and it's a relatively forgiving process if you can remember your basics, which is food, water, and air. And the microbes in the compost require those three things, just like we do. They're aerobes, like humans and animals. Um, and they require some combination of that, hopefully in the right, in the right ratios like your, is your microbe farming basically. So whether you're raising livestock or plants or compost microbes, you need to have the right mix of food, water, and air. And the basic process is in go your raw materials, your organic waste products, something that was alive at some point, um, water, the microbes, and then often there are weed seeds and pathogens, depending on what you're composting. Your pathogens are really gonna be an issue if you're, if you're composting manure. Um, and the microbes are naturally in the environment, they're in the air, they're on the materials, you don't need to inoculate. And then they, those microbes go to town digesting all those raw materials, they consume oxygen like we do, and they, um, breathe, they, breathe, they use oxygen and they put out carbon dioxide as a byproduct and heat just like we do. And then there's some moisture usually lost as steam if you have a hot compost pile. And when you, when you have a, a, the, just the right mix of food, water and air and you have um, a lot of microbes, millions or billions of them in your compost pile, um, using oxygen, putting out carbon dioxide and producing a little bit of heat. The heat starts to accumulate faster than it can escape and the heat within the compost pile starts to, it gets, um, it gets hotter and that's what can be responsible over time for killing pathogens and weed seeds. Now that's gonna, oh, that's, your heat is an indicator that you have a lot of microbial activity and things are decomposing very quickly. Again, you can also compost a slow compost and not worry about things getting hot, but just understand that when you do have heat in your compost pile, it's an indication of a lot, a lot of microbial activity and a really good balance of air and water and food. And then on the, out, on the end, you get finished compost coming out the other side, hopefully of your system. And how long, I mean, I assume with some hot or cold variety, like the, it's, there's different time scales for different there systems, is. right? Is there an average yeah. or? If you're looking at a commercial compost, for example, in which case they absolutely need to reach their, 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 their heat threshold for safety of their finished product. So say a, a, a municipality that's composting maybe food waste and 
leaves and grass clippings or biosolids or anything like that. A, a very typical time frame is 30 days of hot composting and 60 to 90 days of what you'd call a curing phase where it's not quite as hot anymore, but it's, it's just curing and slowly decomposing um, and still converting a lot of those, those um, your, a lot of your ammonia then gets converted over to nitrate in that curing phase. But a 30 day hot cycle, uh, or 30 day primary composting phase is pretty typical on a large scale compost operation. For our climate? For in anywhere, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then when you're looking at that scale, when they, they have to ensure that they have a very high quality and very uniform product to come out for commercial sales, they're adding water and managing their nutrients in a way that most of us at home are not. Caitlin, are there some uh, ratio? Well, maybe ratio isn't the right um, uh, term that I'm looking for, but you know, you've got a recipe, right? Is yeah, there, let's, that's is a good there, point. Let, is let's there get out to the food. Okay. The food part here. So, yeah, okay. so before we get to the food part, I want to think a little bit more about the biology of composting. So this, I, I like this picture a lot because it really shows all many of the different organisms that are involved, microorganisms and larger ones. And what we have at the bottom, if you look at the bottom list, they're the third level consumers. I sometimes I call those our, our chippers or shredders, the ones that are physically breaking down the, the parts of leaves or grass or food waste into smaller pieces. And as they break them down, then the next level comes in and they break them down further. And then your bacteria and your fungi eventually and your worms can get to it, you get it when it's very, very small and start breaking it down into its, its, its smallest pieces, its ionic form. And that's what the plants can use. And, the, and so there's a lot of different organisms involved in this and as they eat and then they die and then they become part of the compost and the other organisms eat them. And it's this very elaborate food web um, that has some similarities actually to the soil food web. So there's a lot going on in there. And when you have a hot compost over 130 degrees or even really over 110 degrees, what you have is primarily bacteria. And as you get into a cooler, slower compost process, your fungi will, will be a big part of that. Your worms and your larger organisms may, um, they'll be part of that along the edges. So the, the, when, when it's really, really hot, that's primarily bacteria at work there because they can tolerate the high temperatures that nothing else can. Okay. So just to show there's a lot of activity going on in there, there's a lot of things to look for. Um, and we do, we talked about food, water, and air. So just remember that as your, as your compost pile is a microbe farm, food, water, and air. They need carbon and nitrogen in a specific ratio, just like you and I need a ratio of proteins and carbohydrates to have a healthy diet, right? Too much of one, it's not healthy. So what you're trying to get when you're with your compost pile is a, a specific ratio of carbon to nitrogen. Now, the carbon to nitrogen ratio that is often used uh, referenced in compost is about 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. And you'll see that in nearly every compost resource you read, about 25 to 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. We, the, the challenge with that is that that's at, a, that's at an, an, an elemental level. So three um, atoms of, or 30 atoms of carbon to one atom of nitrogen, which is not very practical for most of us at home to, to analyze that. So we can do it a little bit by volumes and we break them into things called greens and browns. And so the green materials um, are higher, are energy materials or green materials, they're higher in nitrogen. And your brown materials or bulking materials or carbon materials are higher in carbon. And so what you're really trying to do is to get that balance. Um, if you look at this chart here, you can see that horse manure and hay sometimes can be right in there at that perfect 30 to 1 ratio. Uh, food waste, coffee grounds uh, are, are, are higher nitrogen, for example, than things like sawdust, uh, sawdust and straw and leaves. Um, leaves and grass clippings are a very nice combination together. Food waste and sawdust are a great combination together. So if you look at things, the things at the top of the list need to be mixed with things at the bottom of the list. So try and get right in there somewhere around your 30 to one. Um, one way to do that, they just to trying it at home is by volume. So if you have one volume, one bucket of food waste, two volumes or two buckets of sawdust or straw would be a nice mix with that, for example. So you can start by one to two at home to start playing with those ratios and see what works really well. Caitlin, I have a sort of a, I'm thinking about it at my own place and I don't usually bag with my lawnmower, you know, for other reasons, but when we go through and like dethatch at the beginning of the yard, we have, or at the beginning of the year, we have all of these 
I don't know, clippings in a sense, but they're brown. So that's going to fall more on the bulking side than on the green, like grass clipping side, isn't it? Or is it not? Um, not necessarily. It's still going to fall. Um, it's probably going to be pretty close to balanced, I'm guessing. Um, okay. Because think about, hey, it's dried down, but it still has the protein that was in it when you cut it, right? Okay. Or it still has the nitrogen that was in it when you cut it. Oh, okay. So it's not going to be as green, so to speak, or as high nitrogen as your fresh early spring clippings and as it started to grow, but your thatch is still going to have some nitrogen in it. Okay. It's kind of like, hey, really? Okay. Depending on how mature it is when it's cut, you know? Okay. And the leaves and grass clipping are a fabulous combination. I think a lot of people probably already know that and pick those up together and, and we'll pile those up together and they do really, they do really well. Okay. So this one is another one we've I talked several times about food, water, and air. And if you can kind of remember those three things and then understand where the decomposition happens in the compost pile, then it will make you very good at troubleshooting, I think, in your own, in your, at your own place. So the, the decomposition, the microbial decomposition, so after things have been physically broken down into small pieces by all of our, our shredders and our little insects and worms and various things, um, the microbes, being primarily the bacteria and the fungi, will decompose these small pieces into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And they work in this, in this thin area on the outside of each particle where there is, they have access to air and water at the same time, right? And so the decomposition happens on this, in this thin film of water surrounding each individual particle. Now, if, you have, if it's soggy and wet and, and mucky, um, you're not going to have enough air, right? It's going to become anaerobic. There won't be enough air and it will typically smell bad and decompose very slowly. Not a common issue here, but it could be if you have some very wet materials for some reason, right? Um, because that air, that air, the air space has been filled with water. If it's too dry, you don't, you no longer have that thin liquid film around the outside of each individual particle so, particle piece. And so the decomposition is going to slow down there as well, because as you know, um, the bacteria and fungi need a little bit of moisture to work. So this, if you can kind of remember this um, concept too, it will help you a lot and think about it like a wrung out sponge. A wet sponge is dripping water. A dry sponge is just dry, bone dry, but a wrung out sponge, you've squeezed some of the water out of it, but there's still water in it. There's a tiny bit of moisture on your hands when you touch it. That's what you're really going for here. You know how hard that is to accomplish in our environment? It's challenging. <laughs> it is very challenging. <laughs> but it's always good to, what, to know your goals, right? Yeah. Know what you're going for. Um, and again, it's a very forgiving process. And so if it takes you all year and you pile it up in the back corner of your property and you just know that when you get the hose out a few times a year and add some water to it, it helps, or you just let nature take its course, it will break down eventually. If you want to break it down more quickly and it's important to you for it to get hot if you're worried about weed seeds then these are the things that you'll have to remember but there's nothing wrong with letting it go slow and let nature take its course it will happen things will okay. break down uh here's a here's a really simple system that i like a lot that we've used quite a bit um, in the community garden um, and it's just using some chicken wire or woven wire fencing and making these kind of barrels out of them and allow and that's a great place to put your uh, grass clippings leaves various things there and let it break down over time these won't get these in my experience don't get real hot but that's okay the worms will work in from the bottom um, you can add water you can set a sprinkler on on top you can add some water over time and it will break down and make very nice compost over the long term. And it's just very simple and inexpensive. Is something like this, I, and maybe you said this, but is it pre-mixed as you put it in? Are you stirring it? Is it you just can do over it as time? Much, as much as you want. You can okay. just dump it in as you have time and let nature take its course. You can layer it in there, greens, browns, greens, browns. Um, you, they're very easy to move. You can kind of unhook them where you've clipped them together and move, empty them and move them and then mix them and add water and shovel them back in. Um, it, it really is depends on how much time you have and how important it is to you to get it moved through quickly and get a uniform product. Okay. And so you really think of it as a, as a range. If you understand the basic biology, food, water, and air, and that wrung out sponge concept of where the decomposition is happening and a balance of that greens and browns, then you can adapt your system to be fast or slow depending on what's practical for your place. Okay. Okay. And in our environment, water is primarily, is generally the limiting factor. Definitely. 
Uh, we do have a question if you're ready. Great. Uh, Gwen is asking, can coffee grounds be added to seed bed at planting time or how should coffee grounds be incorporated in vegetable garden and or flower beds? Well, that's a great question. So coffee grounds are, are a tremendous asset. Um, if you don't have a lot of your own, there are a lot of gas stations in most of these small towns that are throwing away buckets of coffee grounds every day and you could probably get some for free. Um, they're a great resource. They're a nitrogen. They're, well, um, coffee's a bean, right? So there's a little higher protein in there and there is um, a, there is, that's a green, I guess, even though it's the color brown, it would be a green if you put it in your compost. Um, so you can, you can put it in your compost, you can use it around your plants, you can mulch with it, you can mix it into a certain amount. There's a very, very good bulletin that's very thorough about using coffee grounds that was published by Washington State University Extension. Um, and it's using coffee grounds in the garden. I would encourage that. Jenny may have that one already, um, and she may be able to share it on the, in the chat, but it's a very thorough resource about how much you can use and when. Okay. Jenny's also uh, reminding us that uh, since she's a lazy composter, it's somebody has suggested to her to plant a zucchini in her compost pile, and when it gets wilty, then it's time to water it. Uh, that's a great system. I like the zucchini as the indicator species. Sometimes yeah. if you just put old squash in your compost pile, it'll grow anyway. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good, good reminder. Here's a reminder about just um, chopping things up or making them more uniform. It will have, it will compost a lot faster if you do it as opposed to just piling dark, large sticks and, and branches and things. Um, and then this was, let's see, this picture was in October. And then this is what it looked like in March with some water, as we remembered, it could remember throughout the winter a little bit and, and, and fall to water. And it does start to break down and become a really nice woody um, mulch type material. Uh, the, you, uh, I think Abby might have asked this, but, but I don't recall. Do you, when you're using your cage system, are you packing things in or just setting, just dumping it in there? I've just been dumping it in and the weight starts to pack it down. You don't want to pack it too densely. Well, again, think about you want some air space, right? Yeah. And you also, yep. if it's too porous, the water evaporates too quickly. So you're trying to try to get this, this balance of what holds a little bit of moisture, but has also some air at the same time. Okay. So you've also talked about this being like a pretty forgiving system. Are there ways that it's like that you've absolutely ruined your compost bed and you need to start over or, or is it always like a, you can fix it and here's how you can fix it. Does that make sense? No, it does make a lot of sense. The only thing I would consider ruined is if you had something in there that was um, contaminated with herbicides. Um, there's a few classes of herbicides that are extremely persistent and very effective at very low levels and will persist in the soil for up to five years. Uh, and they're typically used for killing broadleaf herbicide or broadleaf weeds in grasses is where they're often used, um, thistles or different things like that. Uh, there's ways you can test for that. Things like 2,4-D and glyphosate, they break down so quickly. I wouldn't spray 2,4-D on my lawn, immediately cut the clippings and put them in my garden. But if you're taking those grass clippings and composting them and several months later, they end up in your garden or the next year, um, it shouldn't be a problem at all. They break down very, very quickly. Yeah, it's a couple of years. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, uh, Caitlin, that uh, class of chemistry, it's clopyrrolid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, 20 years ago, there were many uh, uh, uses for it in turf and uh, places like that. And it started showing up in compost piles and uh, civic areas and a lot of those applications of that particular product have been removed from the market. But yes, things like yes. that will still show up, unfortunately. And and if, if people are reading their labels correctly and, and it will say do not compost, you know, manure from animals that have been fed hay that were spread, sprayed with this or various things. But uh, as we know, Jeff, not everyone reads their labels as carefully as they should. Um, the other thing that you can do if you're worried at all about your compost, and it's really not a bad idea anyway, it's very easy, is you do what's called a bioassay, which is a very fancy term for a grow test. So you take some compost and you grow something in it. And if it grows and it grows well, then you know there's probably nothing wrong with your compost. Um, things like beans um, are particularly sensitive to that class of herbicide. So you can grow beans and they grow quickly. Um, tomatoes, you know, peas. anything like that. Peas. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you're buying large quantities of compost from somebody, 
um, or getting a lot of manure and making your own and you're about to put a lot of it into your garden, it wouldn't hurt to just set this time of year, just set a little bit on your windowsill, plant a few things in it and see if they grow well. It could save you a lot of heartache. Uh, we have a question from Rick. Please explain what a compost activator is and how beneficial it is. And then follow up can or should ash from a wood stove be incorporated into a compost pile? So yes, ash from a wood stove can be incorporated into a compost pile. I would probably keep it under 10 or 15% of your total volume. You don't wanna overwhelm your system with it, but it does have a lot of nutrients in it, mineral nutrients. The second paper would be the same thing. So office paper, newspaper, anything, probably not your shiny paper won't break down as well, but any of your, of your um, white paper or your newspaper or your cardboard, um, it doesn't have a lot of, doesn't have a lot of biological act, um, activity. It's not very biologically active in terms of a food source, but it does have a little bit and it doesn't hurt anything. And you could add that into your compost too. Um, but the general um, numbers that are recommended for that are 10% or so of your total volume. Um, would be the best for that. Um, in terms of the activators, the activators I've seen on the market are typical, I've often seen the activators that are nitrogen based um, or that are some sort of microbes. They're not necessary. Uh, you could try it, I suppose, if you, if you were inclined, but they're really not necessary because the microbes are so active already in the environment and they're already on the materials. They're, everything's already there that you need if you get your conditions right. If you do find that you're trying to compost something that's very high carbon and you need some nitrogen, um, just some lawn fertilizer could be used. Mm -hmm. um, alfalfa hay could be used. I've even seen people use things like dog food. That's a high protein, right? That's a nitrogen. Sure. A little bit of th things like that could be added if you if you if you had a a um, if you were overwhelmed with your high carbon materials, for example, and you really wanted to make a nice compost and you know and you knew you needed some nitrogen. Um, that would be one way to do it. And I think some of the compost activators I've seen are, are, are nitrogen sources. But in general, it is not necessary. Okay. These are, these are some other pictures here I just wanted to throw up here that, that are um, uh, some simple systems you can do. A three bin system is very common. Um, and that's the picture on the top there. You can make it with pallets or with wire or with cinder blocks or anything you wanted. And the concept with a three bin system is you pile all your raw materials in one as shown in this picture. And then you, when the, when the whole thing is full, you take your pitchfork or your tractor or whatever, and you move it into the second bin. And that gives you a chance to move it and aerate it and mix it. And then you have an empty bin on your left again. So you'd put your raw materials there. When that fills up, you'd move both of those piles sort of down the row. And then by the time you get out the third one, it's been moved three times and it kind of helps you keep organized and keeps things mixed and aerated. That's a very simple, tidy method that can be used um, to keep organized and to keep the product moving through. Um, Caitlin, so it looks to me like one of these is in the sun and one of them is in the shade, which made me wonder if there's any advantage to placement like that of where your compost is. I don't know there's a huge advantage. I think the advantage here might be the shade only because moisture is already limited. And if it's in the shade, it may evaporate. It'll stay a little, in the summer, when it's hot and dry, um, you may lose less moisture to evaporation. That would be my guess. I don't know for sure. I guess the other option is um, in the winter when it's already when it's so cold, you may want the sun to keep it a little warmer. So sure. I don't have a good answer on that. I think you'd have to just think about how you're managing it and where your location is and what's practical for you. Okay. We Here's do a, have, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. No, go We've ahead. got another one from uh, Facebook. Laura has asked, or it's kind of a statement. I was given a barrel type com composter. I roll it frequently and try to remember to water, but it seems to take forever to get the end product. Any tips? Yeah, I think the challenge with the barrel roller type is, again, getting enough water in there, food and water. That may be one that does really well to be in the shade, perhaps. Um, you also, it, it may be one that does better to fill it all up at once. I, I, don't, I don't know, but you could try this, filling it all up at once so you have enough kind of critical mass in there, enough bulk to keep the biology going better. Um, add the water, do it all as a one batch and then take it out and then start a new batch as opposed to trying to add a little bit from your kitchen each day or something. That may work better. You could experiment with that, but probably water is the big thing. 
I have a tumble composter that I used in a more um, humid environment than where we currently live and it worked out okay but I haven't used it since we moved here <laughs> yeah a another system that could work you could convert that over is if you take a, a garbage can or a 55 gallon drum and you drill holes in it all the way around and then you dig a hole in your land somewhere in your garden or landscaping and you bury that up to the surface up to the top and then it's got holes in it and then you can put your your food waste or your the materials in there and the worms and the microbes it doesn't have as much oxygen but it, it is down at the root level and so the worms and the microbes kind of move in and out of there and decompose things um it could stays very mm -hmm. moist because of the soil the plant roots can kind of grow into that area and it uh it almost becomes a bit of a deep feeder for your landscape plants um so that could be another use for a barrel like that we've done that um also with five gallon buckets and some raised beds and so if you if you sink a five gallon bucket with a lot of holes in it into it in the middle of your raised bed with a lid, the lid can keep critters out and you can put your food waste and some leaves or some newspaper or something in there. And then the organisms and the worms move in and out and the plant it kind of feeds the whole raised bed. So that's something else to experiment with. Hmm. <clears throat> you also should expect some volume reduction. So this picture shows that from your new compost, you have both you can recognize what it's made out of, you can see all the raw materials, you can tell what the sticks and the leaves and the food waste is. And you have a certain volume and by the time you're done composting typically you'll have maybe a 40 to 50% volume reduction so the whole thing will have shrunk and it will become more uniform and harder to tell what the raw materials were. So that's a good indicator too that your compost has composted. So Caitlin, we talked a little bit, I think, just through the different questions in your pictures about some of the things that are going into your compost piles, but are there things or can you touch on the things that should not go into your compost pile? So that's a very good question. Most of your materials, if you read about backyard composting or home composting, will tell you to leave out meat scraps, dairy, fats and oils, pet waste, dead animals, all the things. That is primarily because there's a high risk of attracting pests and having odors and it being poorly managed or not managed appropriately for those types of materials. All of those things will compost very well and they contain a lot of nutrients and the bacteria love those types of ingredient, um, food sources, I guess, right? And composting can be used very effectively to handle human waste, pet waste, um, dead animals, meat scraps, veg, all the things. Again, if you're composting at home, the risk you have to consider is, is this a high risk of odor and attracting the neighbor's dogs or rats to my backyard? And so that may be why you would want to avoid that. But they are all very nutrient dense materials that can, um, instead of going to the landfill, can be converted into a soil amendment. And we sure need a lot of um, soil amendments in our, in our thin topsoils here. If you're really determined or interested in composting pet waste, for example, there is a very, very good bulletin that actually is from Alaska, um, and they were developing a, a very simple compost system for sled dog waste. And it uses a similar barrel system like I showed you those pictures of in a long, slow period of time. And they don't recommend that you put it around your vegetables, but you can put it around your landscaping. So if you have a lot of dogs, you might consider that as a way to capture a lot of those nutrients. Um, and that's a bulletin out of Alaska in RCS that's very good. I can share that with Jenny. It could go up on the on your okay. backyard site. So those are things, wool is the other one. Um, we have a lot of wool around here um, from some of our sheep ranches that is not really high quality, that's not gonna make it into the finished wool product markets, but is still available to use. That can make a very good soil mulch. It's about 10% nitrogen, but it breaks down slowly. Hair, feathers, all of those contain nitrogen and other nutrients and can break down slowly. Um, so those can go into a compost pile or just directly onto the soil. Um, if you are gonna compost food waste, making sure, you know, a drum can be a one way to do it because it keeps the critters out or a buried bucket, like I said, just because it keeps animals out um, or making sure it's very thoroughly buried under two or so, so feet of their finished compost or sawdust or something that will keep the odors down. Mm, okay. Uh, we have another question uh, from Rachel. I've heard of people directly burying their kitchen straps in, excuse me, kitchen scraps. <laughs> <laughs> In the rows between the vegetables, uh, do we get enough moisture for that to break down and be useful in the garden? Yeah, you're going to have to experiment with that a little bit. I have done that. Um, I, it can be great, especially people who do a lot of fishing or maybe butcher their own chickens and maybe have 
at one point in time, a large quantity or significant quality quantity and may bury it around their fruit trees or in those types of places. Of course, it has to be buried quite deep. And if we were just discussing earlier today, if you have bears or other critters in your neighborhood, um, you might wanna be extremely careful about that. Um, but yes, what's gonna start happening is if you do it a little bit at a time and make sure you're keeping um, some moisture in your soil, as you start adding more and more food to your soil and you end up with more and more organic material, your microbial population in your soil is gonna significantly increase. And as that starts to increase, your decomposition rate's gonna increase. And so you'll find that stuff breaking down faster and faster, but it may be a little lag initially. Um, it depends on what type of soil you, you have. If you have a sandier soil, it may work better because you have a little more airflow in your soil. Um, the clay soil can be hard because they can be very compacted often. There's a lot less airflow in those soils. It's a lot denser, heavier soils. Um, you may wanna make sure it's deep enough so the dogs don't dig it up. So yes, it absolutely can work. You're just gonna have to experiment with what the best method is for your place and how you wanna deal with that. And maybe a series of buried buckets um, and cans is a better way to do that. I don't know, you'll have to play around with it. Okay. Um, Heidi is asking for hair. Does it matter if it's been colored? I don't know. I mean, I, I, some people will say, it's a good question. Some people will say, don't put any printed, you know, colored inks or anything like that. You know, I would put the hair dye maybe in the same category. I am of the mind that when you have healthy soil and you have a lot of microbial activity, they are the best tool we have for breaking down what you'd call contaminants or toxins or art of, you know, synthetic Increase synthetic materials like hair dye or paint, or I'm not paint, um, it, newspaper ink, um, um, antibiotics or dewormers that might be in your animal manure, or any of those things. They really are just another, they're a carbon chain, and the carbon chain is another food source for the microbes, and so the microbes will break them down. That is why those clopyrrolids, Jeff, when they first hit the industry of, of the compost industry, everyone was so shocked because there has never been another, there had never been another material that compost couldn't break down. Yeah. microbes and compost and so it was very a shock to the industry that's very very unusual and nearly everything else um is just another carbon chain for the microbes to break down with time so i personally wouldn't worry about putting dyed hair in my compost but that's up to you okay uh and then rick is asking i raise pigeons and would like to compost the waste what ratio should be used so pigeon manure, like chicken manure, bird waste in general is very high nitrogen. It's considered very hot and it would be um, more in the, if you dried it instead of composting, it'd be more in the lane of a fertilizer as opposed to an amendment. And so you'd want to mix, I would mix that. Um, I, I know there's, there's bedding in there, there's sawdust in with those pigeons. And so I would mix it with your sawdust um, pretty generously to begin with and pile it up. I think those, those wire, um, Hoops like bins I showed you, I think would work potentially well for that if you had a finer wesh, mesh wire so that the sawdust didn't fall out the sides. Um, and I would clean your chicken, your pigeon coop that has some bedding in it. And then I would add another probably equivalent volume of sawdust to it or leaves, dried leaves would be great. Add a lot of water, put those in those, put that in those um, wire bins and get yourself a little thermometer and watch the temperature. And if it gets hot, you know you have the right ratio of food and water, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I would do the same if I had chickens. If you bed your chickens very lightly with just a little bit of sawdust or your pigeons with just a little bit of sawdust, you probably want to add a little bit of sawdust when you, when, or some leaves, for example, when it comes out and when you compost it. If you bed your animals very heavily with sawdust, then it may be enough as it is just right as it comes out of the coop. Mm. If it gets hot, you know you've got the right ratio. And if it doesn't smell bad, if it smells bad, like ammonia, you need more grounds. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's it for now for questions. That's from all the questions. Our audience, yes. Um, I'll hit really quickly on straw bale gardening. Some mm -hmm. folks are familiar with that. You can look it up. There's lots of videos and fun ideas on it. It is essentially composting in place because you have a very high carbon material. You add a lot of nitrogen in the form of usually lawn fertilizer, but you could add something else. It starts to get hot, it breaks down. You then have a bale, essentially a bale of compost to plant into. So that's really what's happening with straw bale gardening. Um, it's just, again, your carbon, nitrogen, water, microbes, 
and that's making compost in a bale. It's the same as growing your zucchini in your compost pile. There you go. Exactly. It's a pretty <laughs> cool system. You'll see it gets hot, right? You add that nitrogen, it gets hot, and then it cools off, and then it's time to plant. Um, the other thing to think about using your compost for, for is sheet mulching. This is a really, really great way to take um, some old lawn or you know, edge of your landscaping and build your garden. Instead of building raised beds or instead of tilling down into the soil, you basically build the soil up. You can use some newspaper and cardboard as a barrier, lay all your compost on it, and you can make a really nice kind of instant garden. Um, and you can also layer your greens and browns and let, let kind of compost slowly in place over the, over the year. And then by next year, we're ready to plant. So those are other things to think about when it comes to composting and sheet mulching. So Caitlin, you've said let it get hot or when it gets hot a couple of times, what temperature is hot? So um, if, if it's hotter than it is outside and your ambient, tem ambient temperature, you know that's an indicator of microbial activity, right? You know that there's a significant amount of microbial activity. 110 degrees is about where you start transitioning over from into what we call our thermophilic or our heat loving microorganisms, a lot of activity. 130 degrees Fahrenheit is what the industry standard is for pathogen reduction or pathogen kill. So if you are selling compost and you're composting things like food waste or biosolids, you have to hit 130 degrees Fahrenheit to meet the, the um, EPA standards for composting. And so we use that um, as a general standard to look at for pathogen kill in your compost. And if you dig into it and you find ash, you know it's been too hot. Uh, right. If it starts on fire, then it's too yes. hot. Yeah. <laughs> Don't recommend burning it. That's a big waste. Not intentionally. Um, not intentionally, yeah. Um, so that that's what I am happy to answer as many questions as people may have. If you just remember food, water, and air, um, and remember that wrung out sponge, and from there, um, and then in te and watching temperature potentially as your indicator. Even if you dig into your compost pile with your hand and it just feels a little bit warmer than it does outside, it shows you that there is some activity and it's breaking down, right? Um, worms won't come in until it's cooled off. Worms don't like it over there. They want it about 70 degrees. They will come in um, after it's cooled off. If you get an initial hot phase, they'll come in later. And if you don't get initial hot phase, the worms will be very, very active in sort of a longer, slower, cooler compost, which is also good. <clears throat> Caitlin, when I, when I compost, uh, my compost pile is mainly leaves. And I usually mound it because I have a large quantity of things that I collect. And what I find is, and I, it might be a um, mounding might not be the right answer for me because it seems to shed the water. Uh, right. in, instead of uh, allowing it to soak into my compost. So should I, would it be more intelligent to kind of spread that out a little bit, water it down and then pile it back up? Or what would you recommend? Yes, it is very hard to add water to an existing mounted compost pile the way you just described. One thing you can do is, is hollow the top out, kind of make a basin in the top just so that water doesn't run off and then run a sprinkler on it. I've had some success using even a soaker hose um, flattening out the top, whether it's a windrow or a pile, and using a, a soaker hose on it, that can that can work. Um, spreading it out, getting it wet, and then piling it back up. Okay. If your leaves, if you're picking up your leaves with some sort of mower or mulcher or something or a leaf vacuum where they're in smaller pieces, that's going to help a lot. When they're large pieces, of course, they're not going to hold water as well. And as soon as things start breaking down and you start to see that transition over. Of course, then it starts to act more like a sponge and hold water. Sure. But yes, having it mounted up uh, does not does not retain water well. Okay, I will change my practices. Yes, change your practices. <laughs> <laughs> I just put the seed in table back up here. I think it's helpful. Um, and if there's questions on certain materials you're wondering about where they would film this, I'm happy to chat with you about that or other other ingredients. Uh, Jenny said you had some other slides about um, worms. I do have slides about worms. I'm happy to talk about worms if folks are interested. I have switched to worm composting primarily for my own food waste because I just, it works really well. It's simple. Um, it's kind of fun. So um, I'll share what I have here on the worm situation. <clears throat> you can do it inside. You can do it under your kitchen counter, in your basement, in your garage, indoors or outdoors. The castings are the worm um, 
compost is very, very good for seed germination, um, house plants, gardens, various things. There are some, um, you, you can get more detail on how to manage and use those. You'll have to do some, you can look some of that up yourself, but um, there is a great option, right? You can do it on a large scale or a small scale. And it's not really, it's not earthworms we talk about, it's these red wigglers. <clears throat> they are surface worms or compost worms. They reproduce very quickly and produce large amounts of organic waste. They really move, they really um, only eat it after it started to rot a little bit. So when you put the food waste in your worm bin, it takes a while for the, first of all, bacteria have to start eating on the outside mm -hmm. of it. And then the worms actually come in and eat the bacteria. They really thrive at about 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I keep my house a little colder. And I notice when I move my worm bin from my house to my office, the population, they reproduce a lot faster because it was just that little mm -hmm. bit warmer for them. Again, they also need food, water, and air. They do not, I, I have I have experimented a little bit with worms on a larger scale outside, sort of in a big bin outside with some butcher waste. They do eventually break that down and it did fine. And when we pulled it out, you could see the whole masses of worms like right inside the bones and everything. They will break it down. It's the same thing. Again, you may not want that in your under your kitchen cabinet in your kitchen if it smells bad or something. I've never had an issue with odors from worms, but again, just something to manage. I've had more of an issue with fruit flies moving into my worm bins than anything. Sure. Um, but it's it's great. And then you can give the worms away. You can sell the worm castings. Again, it can be scalable. This is what some of the bins I'm using right now. This is at the office. Um, I I manage the moisture really carefully, but I had I've had some trial and error. You, you can also drill holes in the bottom and put them on a tray so that if you have excess moisture, it drains out. Um, I find that there are some challenges with that again, because then you have this sort of smelly stuff coming up the bottom. So I try and just manage the moisture carefully so I don't have a lot of drainage. Um, paper and cardboard, corrugated cardboard and newspaper are probably are, are two egg cartons are two are very, very good materials. Um, leaves also, um, dry leaves are also a great material and they need to stay pretty moist in there. About like the wrung out sponge, kind of the same idea. Okay. Uh, and there they are. Now you can see there's the worms working and there's little tiny, tiny worm castings there you can see on this newspaper. Doing their thing. Doing their thing. And that's after they've done their thing for quite a while. This is all worm castings that used to be newspaper and food waste. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so uh, what would you say the... Um, you mentioned you would have about 40% from when you started a compost pile. Is it about the same when you're doing worm? Compost? Oh boy, that's a good question, Jeff. I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't really figured that one out. I just keep adding stuff till it's full. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm glad I was question. able to ask you a good question. Yeah, you got, you got me. Um, you can do this outside in a trench. There's actually a gal in Laramie, the worm wrangler, and she does a great job. She does a larger scale and does a lot of it outside in a, in a, and she said in the fall, like she'll collect all the pumpkins and she has a, this trench and she puts them in there and the worms. And, it, and when it gets really cold, they'll slow down reproducing or some of them may die, but they'll go right to the middle where there's holds the most, most heat and they'll lay eggs. And then when it warms up again, the eggs hatch. And so you don't necessarily lose all your worms if they can get down below the level of the soil kind of in these oh, sure. compost trenches and wait out the winter. So, and that can be done in manure. Again, they will not tolerate the heat. So if you have your compost and if say you're doing a large manure worm composting deal, it'll get hot. Often the compost or the manure will get real hot. And then once it cools off, then it's time for the worms. They will not tolerate the extreme temperatures that the bacteria will. Okay. Uh, Angela would like to know how long did it take for the worms to get it to that point uh, from the starting point? What, what was the time frame? Yeah, it depends a lot on how many worms you have. Um, when you start out with a worm bin, typically you have just a small amount and then they reproduce. My worm bin now, those black bins I showed you are very full. Uh, they need to be emptied. In fact, if anybody wants some worms, they need to be emptied. And um, when I put food waste in there, it's gone very quickly. Basically, as soon as it starts to rot a little bit, so a couple of days, then the worms move in and, and move through it pretty fast because there's so many of them in there and they're now more worms than I have room to feed them, if that makes sense. You're, you're running out of food. <laughs> yeah, I, I have too many, I'm overstocked on my, on my livestock there. So, yeah. um, so I need to get that bin cleaned out, but it does go pretty, pretty fast once. So what, what you happens is if you were to come get a handful of worms and start your own worm bin, you can overwhelm them very quickly because you only maybe have 50 worms in there or whatever. And so as they start to grow, um, it gets faster and faster. So that's not much of an answer, but that's sort of what I've noticed. So uh, typically 30 days, or are you talking longer, shorter? What do you think? 
I'd say a couple. My best guess is a couple weeks. Okay. All to right. Break that stuff down. Okay. Um, now there's some really good books. Uh, Worms Eat My Garbage is one of them. You can look up. And of course, YouTube is a fabulous resource for all of these things. You can have a lot of fun watching worm composting videos on YouTube and getting ideas for how people manage it. Okay. We have this is some... my this is oh, the sorry. raised bed composting I talked about earlier, and you can see it's mostly worms in there working. And those are worms that are like more of a I don't know what would you, a native worm that's well, already I, existing I out put, there. I put red wigglers in here, the compost okay. worms. What's in there now? I don't know. Uh, probably a combination of of something. Okay. But I started with the red wiggler compost worms. Okay. But uh, you can start with earthworms. Okay. okay. We have some questions coming in from Facebook. Uh, Christina, our dump offers free compost. What are the risks of using it? Um, many municipalities offer free compost. I would have no concerns about using it. Um, but what it would not be a bad idea, especially if you're going to get a significant amount, um, is take a bucket, ask for a bucket for a sample, and right now get put up, mix it with a little bit of soil and put it on your windowsill and grow three or four things in it just to make sure. Um, it's a very simple thing to do, and it, would, it, it could save you some heartache just in case there was some contamination there. But every time um, you get a load, you should do that because it the, really wouldn't hurt. The, the contents will change over time, right? Or the source of material. Yeah. It's a very simple thing to do. Uh, most municipalities are composting yard waste of some sort, and several around the state are doing biosolids. Appy may be able to tell us which ones. I know Laramie is. Um, and the biosolids is basically the, the, the product that comes out of the wastewater treatment plants and it, it's basically dead bacteria. The bacteria that have eaten the, the, the sewer waste is processed, the human waste, and then it's processed by also by microbes and then those dead microbes are then what comes out and then those are composted is really the simplest way to say what that is. Um, a lot of my graduate research was done with biosolids. Again, I'm, I'm, we looked at breakdown of antibiotics and other contaminants in the compost and found that it was very effective. Uh, again, I'm, I have a lot of confidence in the ability of the microbes to break down what we would call contaminants. But that, of course, is a personal choice of what you're willing or interested to do with it. Um, so you'd have to ask your own questions about what's in it. But most of it's going to be yard waste, I believe, and some biosolids. Sure. Abby, do you know who around the state is doing that? I don't off the top of my head, but we did do a um, like a landfill survey a couple of years ago, asking them a lot of these questions, and I might have the information in that um, yeah. in those results that I could pull up and look at it if anybody wanted to get in contact with me or contact our Carbon County office. I, I might have that information. Yeah. So I would I would be, feel very confident using municipal compost, um, and especially if I just did a little road test in my window so. Uh, if I can, Nancy asks, where do you get red wigglers? Um, well, if you're anywhere near Orland, I would be, or coming through, I'd be glad to give you a lot. There's a gal in Laramie. You can find her. I think she has a Facebook page, The Worm Wrangler. There are, you, you can call your extension office. Um, a lot of master gardeners will have them. Um, you can ask on any classifieds. A lot of people have them around and are happy to give you a handful of them because their worm bins are overflowing. Do they ship well? Yes, you can order them online. There are actually a lot of places that sell them online, um, and I'm not sure how they ship them, but they do, and it's, there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities for that. Okay, very good. Um, let's see. Uh, we had one. We had a question from Facebook earlier that we that before the program um, from Susan. I want to know how much pine wood uh, or cones and needles I can add to my compost. Um. Pine cones are challenging because of their size, right? So again, it's like adding large chunks of wood, kind of, I guess I would describe it as that. It's gonna take a long time to break down. Um, if you can put them through a wood chipper or have them, if they're of any size and have them smaller, it will, they'll break down faster. Um, they're, and the pine needles are gonna also be in the browns category. They, um, and you can add as much as you want, as long as you have enough greens to balance them out. That's all I would say is you need something sure. to balance them out. And again, remember particle size and just time, right? Breaking those more woody materials down. So I wouldn't have an issue. I wouldn't, I don't see any problem with composting a lot of pine needles if you had a lot of manure or something to go with it. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if part of that question is uh, what about using 
that substance or those sources, uh, are you concerned about acidification of the soil? Uh, no, the, the quantity, first of all, the compost process itself neutralizes a lot, yeah. right? Um, and that's why it can handle a little bit of ash, a little bit of pine, all these things. It's a very neutralizing process once all the microbes are done doing their work, right? It becomes a humus, right? Which that helps neutralize the soil. Um, we have very alkaline soils here anyway. So if you had somewhat acidity in your pine needles and you're using it in your soil, it, we already have alkaline soil. So you're not, you don't have a risk of making your soils too acidic. Okay. Um, yeah, did that, did that, did that, was that the question? I think so, yes. Uh, on the flip side of that, uh, do you have to worry about ashes making the compost in your soil more alkaline? Um, you, you could if you overdid it. That's where I would keep it in that probably 10 to 15% by volume um, of your compost. Again, if it does get too alkaline, it may slow the process down a little bit. Uh, it's a natural process. It's very forgiving. Um, if you notice that you can experiment a little bit. I wouldn't lay the ash on real thick in my garden if I was going to lay a lot of put a lot of ash in or incorporate it into the up to the top surface. I would do it in the fall to give a, a lot of time for it I mean, to equalize. I, okay. Um, but in the compost, I don't, I don't, I, I would use it. It's got, there's a lot of minerals in it. Okay, perfect. Uh, I just you encourage have... people to experiment a lot and to understand the basic biology and not be intimidated by it and just know that you just it's food and water and air and experiment and, and figure out what works for you in, in your system. Sure. Uh, did you um, have any more on worms before we? No, this was, I think, mostly it. Um, if you are going to get into worm composting, I would say worm composting is less forgiving if you're going to do it in your home, especially or in bins, than composting outside um, because you can get insect infestations or you can get things can smell but it's not very complicated either. Um, and so if you are really interested in worm composting, I, like I said, YouTube is actually a great resource. There's a very good book called Worms Eat My Garbage. That's very thorough and explains how to do it. And um, I think even on the Barnyards and Backyards website, there's a worm composting bulletin or article. Um, and it's, fun. it's really fun. It's really fun for kids, I think. Um, I've taken my worm bin to a lot of classes and different things and the kids have a lot of fun with it too. So I would encourage you to try it out. Of course they do. Worm. <laughs> fun, fun stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Christina is asking how much compost can be added to a vegetable garden annually? Is there too much or is there such a thing as too much? That's a very good question. Um, you can grow things straight in compost if you wanted. Um, the, the challenge, like this picture right here we're looking at in this raised bed is 100% compost, but it's <laughs> been layered over time. When we built this bed, we started with layers of hay and manure and leaves and straw and we kind of did a sheet mulch sheet composting method in here and so every year it settles and breaks down and we put more leaves and coffee grounds and whatever compost on top so it's really nearly 100 percent compost the the risk becomes if you have um your compost is not mature enough and by not mature enough i mean um often high in ammonia and and the, and you have to sort of it's too rich or too hot in which case then you have an excess of nutrients or um, it's just burns the plants a little bit. So that's a maturity sure. issue more than a too much compost issue. Okay. All right. Uh, still filtering in from Facebook. Ryan is asking thoughts on Johnson Sioux bioreactor. That's a really good question. I do not know much about it. And I, I the little bit that I have learned about it has been on YouTube and reading a few short articles. I don't have a lot of direct experience, but I think it's very heavy on the fungal um, decomposition as opposed to bacterial, which has some different advantages. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, we're bumping up against the end of our time. This is your last opportunity to ask questions before Caitlin is gone. <laughs> Okay, none on Facebook, none here. Thank you, Caitlin, for being here. Well, thank and you. I hope I, I hope I answered some questions and gave people a few more questions. That's always the goal, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and and uh, Abby, if you want to take us out, yes. let's wrap it up. <laughs> All right. So um, for all of you that are joining us today, we love getting um, feedback that really helps us 
um, give direction to the programs and what kind of you know guests to come in next time. So there'll be evaluation opportunities on Facebook. I think that uh, Jenny puts that in the chat and then on our Zoom, when you close out of Zoom, then there'll be an uh, opportunity. So we really appreciate um, you taking the time for that feedback. Um, it does look like one more question maybe came in while I was beginning oh. a wrap up. Yeah. Do you want to ask for Rachel or do you want me to ask? No, I can ask. So okay. this says, can you share some of the most unconventional things that you can compost? Oh, that's a fabulous question. Um, dead animals, it's actually a really good disposal option for dead animals and butcher waste. We've done, we're doing, uh, I've done, some of my graduate research was with that. I've worked with some larger scale dairies and feedlots on disposing of dead animals that way. And we're getting to re ready to work with the Wyoming um, DEQ on some workshops um, for municipalities on, on composting dead animals. So that can certainly work. Um, and there's some work that's been done with contaminated soils, particularly contaminated with um, hydrocarbons, I think, and from mine land and um, chemicals. And so being able to take that soil itself, mix it with compost that's active, let those microbes work on breaking down the contaminants and then reusing that soil. So there's some really interesting things that can be done um, I did mention that really if it's if it's a carbon chain or if it's some, um, I, I, I talked about composting being really best for things that are uh, living or were living, but hydrocarbons, you can look at at that or different contaminants that have a carbon chain in the, and it just becomes a food for the microbes and they break it down. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting actually. There also is some research being done specifically on composting as a way to dispose of pharmaceuticals because in some states it's very difficult to dispose of them. They have to be transported across state lines under armed guard to an incinerator, it's very expensive. And so they have, they're looking at using composting specifically as a way to, to denature or to break these down and dispose of them in a more affordable manner. So there's another interesting one. Yeah, yeah cool. Very Good question, thanks Rachel. Um, let's see, so we'll go ahead and wrap up then. Thank you for, um, Thank you for joining us today, Caitlin. Again, if you can provide us some um, feedback on the show, we appreciate that. Jenny has pulled up um, our barnyards and backyards resources. So under the composting tab, um, there's, yep, she's going to click it. So there's all sorts of different articles that we've included in barnyards and backyards and then other publications. So other extension publications or just um, other uh organizations have put them up there too. So definitely check that out if you're looking for more on the topic. Um, we, I know that there's a few shows still coming up in um, our Barnyards and Backyards live lineup for the rest of the month of April. What, there's two more shows. Um, so definitely tune in to those and then we'll take a little break for the summer while everybody is out being busy and enjoying and enjoying those outdoors um all of our all of the counties in the state have oh yes sorry there's also um all of these get recorded and posted um on youtube and so here's the the links that you can go back and watch this show and other shows so if you want to um, go back and view a certain point of this or other shows um, also, each one of our counties in the state of Wyoming have an extension office, so if you want to stop in and um, just visit with folks, pick up publications, all of that, then just know that there's an office in every county. And I think with that, hopefully I covered all the things. So thank you, Caitlin, you for joining us today. We thank really you appreciate much. it. it very, fun. very good program. Thank you all for being with us.